Hello and welcome to our fourth talk of the Wonder Kids Lecture Series. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sav Nayibur and I'm Research Manager at the UBC Early Development Research Group. Also helping us out today is Vera Mueller, our wonderful EDRG Recruitment Coordinator, who some of you may have had contact with. Um, speaking to us today is Dr. Susan Birch, who along with her fantastic team of trainees at the Kid Study Center studies how social perspective taking impacts the development, decision making and health of children. The Kids Study Center is one of seven research centers that make up the early development research group here at UBC. Because most of the research that Dr. Birch will tell us about today took place on campus at the University of British Columbia, I would like to acknowledge that our campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. But of course, this is a virtual event. Um, and so I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of the many lands that you may be joining from both near and far. Uh, Dr. Birch today is actually joining us from PEI, uh, which is very cool. So I will introduce her in just a moment and she will speak for about 30 minutes. Afterwards, she will answer your questions, taking us to about two o'clock here in Vancouver. Please do feel free to pop in and out as you need. We understand, uh, know that many of you have little tots at home. To gather your questions, we will be using the Q&A menu that you can access via a button at the bottom of your screen. Please submit your questions there. You can submit any time as they come to you. And then after her talk, um, Dr. Birch will, will answer as many questions as she can. If you're unable to stay for the entire talk or have technical issues, don't worry. We will be posting a recording on the EDRG website events page. All right, so I am delighted to introduce Dr. Susan Birch to you today. She is Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology at, here at UBC. She completed her PhD in Psychology at Yale in 2004 and then immediately joined UBC and us here at the Early Development Research Group, continuing her program of innovative research on theory of mind and social perspective taking. Among her awards is the dissertation award from the American Sorry, I lost my place. The American Psychological Association and the Early Career Scholar Award from the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies. Lately, Sue has been leading a project that explores the social impact of the COVID pandemic on parents and children's social functioning and social emotional health. If you are a member of our EDRG database of families, you may well have received an invitation to participate in this online study. And if you have, thank you so much for, your, for contributing to this important work. Um, if you haven't yet participated and would like to, uh, Sue will be providing some relevant details for you to do so right after her talk. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Birch. Thank you so much, Sav. And hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today about some of the work that we've been doing and really uh, trying to just situate this work within the broader uh, literature on children's development and children's understanding of other people's mental states. I want to begin, uh, of course, by acknowledging my wonderful research team and the Tri-Council funding that we get from the government, but especially uh, thank you guys as parents who have participated in our, in our research. It really wouldn't be possible without you, so thank you very much for that. To give you an idea of what I want to talk about today, I'm going to begin by uh, telling you what is social perspective taking and why I think it is very important uh, for so many different aspects of our lives and especially for early learning and development. I will uh, give you an overview of some, uh, just a few studies that we've been conducting that looks at the role of social perspective taking in children's learning and development. If time, I'll briefly mention a limitation in social perspective taking that affects not only young children, but also older children and adults. And then I want to close by discussing ways that uh, parents and others can uh, foster social perspective taking in their young children and in, in themselves. So first, I said I'd tell you what social perspective taking is. Well, it's reasoning about other people's mental states or perspectives, hence the social perspective taking part. And it includes making inferences about a variety of mental states, including intentions, goals, desires, beliefs, uh, thoughts, emotions, and my particular favorite mental state, which is knowledge. So whether we realize it or not, we're routinely making inferences about other people's mental states. And that has a huge impact uh, on how we interact with others, how we make sense of their behavior. I'll mention that this uh, also goes by the term theory of mind. So sometimes social perspective taking and theory of mind are used interchangeably. 
But theory of mind also includes our ability to think about our own mental states. Uh, whereas I'll be focusing mostly today on how children reason about other people's mental states or perspectives. As you might imagine, uh, perspective taking is complex and multifaceted. There's a variety of different mental states. There are a variety of different emotional states, intentions and goals and desires and beliefs, nostalgia and fear and surprise. And so it's a very complex and multifaceted uh, skill set. And as a, as a result, there's no single test for it. In fact, uh, some researchers have counted and there's over a uh, hundred different tests that have been designed. There's no agreed upon test in the way that uh, there might be uh, for intelligence. There's various IQ tests. There's no one particular measure of social perspective taking. It's a, a variety of different measures. So reading other people's nonverbal cues and making inferences about what they might want or feel in a particular situation. All of that counts as social perspective taking. It follows a developmental progression. Now this is a very oversimplified uh, view, but just to give you an idea, in the first year of life, infants can make inferences about other people's goals and intentions. This is something you may have seen if you saw Dr. Kylie Hamlin speak. Uh, as well, by 18 months of age, children understand that people can have different uh, desires or different preferences than they do. They then uh, gradually begin to understand other people's beliefs and knowledge states. And around age four, uh, we're very confident that by four, if not even much earlier, they understand that people can have beliefs that are false or beliefs that aren't consistent with reality. But of course, there are a lot of subtleties and nuances that we begin to uh, acquire over the course of development well into adulthood. Um, it's complicated, right? There's a lot of different cues that we can use uh, to figure out whether somebody's being sarcastic or making a literal statement understanding um, nostalgia and the different situations that might instill that particular emotion. And I don't know if any of you guys are fans of Big Brother, but I'm a big fan of the reality TV show called Big Brother. And if you're watching that, you're engaging in social perspective taking um, on a regular basis. It can be a bit of a mind bender. So when I watch with my husband, I find myself th saying things that I barely understand when I think about it and say things like, he thinks that she wants to keep him, but we know that she wants to vote him out because he doesn't know that she knows that she knows about his alliance. Uh, and so there can be a lot of mental state tracking. And uh, as I'm sure you know, it's, it's very complex. But it's really interesting that even in the first year of life, children start doing this and then they gradually uh, improve upon those skills throughout life. In addition to developmental differences, there's also a lot of individual differences. So, and that individual variability predicts a whole host of uh, health and social functioning outcomes. Just to give you an example, children who are better at social perspective taking tend to engage in more pro-social behavior. So they cooperate more with others, they share more and help with others. They tend to have more satisfying relationships. So they tend to be more well-liked by their peers and they even have better academic achievement scores. And uh, as Sav mentioned at the beginning, we've been conducting a study on uh, both children and parents' social emotional health throughout the pandemic. And parents have been reporting that they've noticed an increase in their children's emotional symptoms and some conduct behavior problems. Seeing an increase of that over the course of the pandemic, most uh, likely due to increased uh, amount of activity that's inside in the home um, as a result of social distancing measures. But the silver lining is that children who uh, are, have higher social perspective taking skills tend to be faring much better. So they're not uh, showing as many social emotional um, problems as their peers. So these uh, social perspective taking skills have a whole host of positive outcomes associated with them. 
And if I haven't convinced you yet that social perspective taking is really important, let me give you a few more examples of the functions that it serves because sometimes it comes so easily and naturally for us as adults, it's difficult to even realize what all is involved in social perspective taking. A lot of the time when we're trying to interpret other people's behavior and make sense of their actions, we have to think about their mental states in particular, uh, what they know or what they're likely to know. So just to show you this cartoon, let's imagine this is the rising real estate prices uh, in Vancouver. And this guy comes along and he adds a whole new layer to the bottom of the graph. The only way that this guy can sort of figure out why this guy's doing that is to posit that he has knowledge that uh, that he doesn't. So he's saying, do you know something I don't know? In addition to making sense of their behavior, we also have to, we can use our mental state understanding to predict behavior. So now that we know he knows something's going to happen in the real estate market, maybe we predict that he's going to sell his house or become a real estate agent, for instance. Of course, these are just inferences and guesses, but these inferences about other people's mental states help us make predictions about how someone will behave in the future or make sense of how they're behaving right now. As well, we use mental state understanding or social perspective taking to manipulate other people's behavior. And while that sounds awful, uh, and parents are often concerned when their child first starts deceiving them, it's really a, a win for the child. It's a developmental milestone. You should feel really good if your child is starting to deceive you because it tells you that they understand how the mind works. They understand that they can know something that you don't know and that they can instill a false belief belief in you. Uh, so deception is actually a good thing if, if used appropriately. Uh, and of course, we need it for tricking and, and engaging, you know, surprising somebody that also involves um, using social perspective taking. And anytime we're communicating with someone, whether it's a teacher in a formal setting or uh, just one on one with someone else, we're routinely making inferences about what someone already knows or what they likely already know. So I don't have to define the word teaching to you. I assume you already know that when I'm communicating with you. But I do need to define the term social perspective taking. It might not be uh, as known or as widely known to others as the word teaching. So anytime I'm communicating, I'm making these really rapid inferences about what other people know or are likely to know. Uh, I put this here just to share a funny uh, anecdote with you. I um, was talking to a colleague. He was on his back deck with his recently turned three-year-old son, and him and his son were uh, playing this game where the child would run and jump off the back deck and his father would catch him. And they did this over and over and over again. Uh, and the child just loved this game. But then he and his father were engaged in conversation and we didn't notice that uh, the son went and jumped off again. And this time his father wasn't there to catch him. He didn't get hurt, but he looked up sort of confused and, and emotionally hurt and said, Daddy, why didn't you catch me? And his father said, I didn't know you were going to jump. And this just sort of shocked him. He looked and he said, but you know everything. Um, so they will need to learn and understand that not everybody knows what they know, or maybe that mom and dad don't know everything. Um, so perhaps it also serves the function of uh, avoiding injury. Um, but the the function I really want to focus on today is the role that social perspective taking plays in deciding who to learn from. So let me give you an example. Check out this guy. What do you think? What is this? Is it an iguana? Is it a chameleon? How are you going to figure that out? There's nothing about him that tells you what it is. You'd have to ask someone in order to find that out. What, what about is it safe to touch? Is it poisonous or will it bite you? Again, this is something you're best to learn from somebody else. Um, if it were in front of you, you could reach out and touch it, but that's a little bit dangerous. And what about these? Are these safe to eat? Possibly, I, I honestly don't know. Um, it's best to ask someone that does know the answer to that rather than to experiment and try them firsthand. 
the point that I'm trying to make is that social learning, that is learning from other people, is essential because some information is really impractical to learn firsthand, to learn on your own, and some information is downright dangerous to learn firsthand. You don't want your child figuring out whether a tiger is safe to pet um, by, by reaching out. You want them to ask someone. And whether you realize it or not, the vast majority of the knowledge that we have as adults is information that we acquired from other people. So we do a lot of social learning all of the time. I know where my kidneys are located, but I didn't learn that through firsthand exploration and I don't advise you do. Uh, we tend to learn from other people. In addition to social learning being uh, essential, some information can only be learned socially. So all of language is acquired from other people. What we call this four-legged animal that barks, in English it's a dog, in Mandarin it's a go. Um, we need to learn all of language from other people. And that's true as well for a variety of other kinds of knowledge that we possess. In the absence of a time machine, I uh, won't be able to experience firsthand what these people's lives were like. And so we learn that um, by learning from others. There's a lot of aspects of science, you know, the, the temperature of the sun or the number of planets or the shape of our galaxy. All of that comes by learning from other people. And similarly, microbiology and things that we can't experience firsthand, we can learn about from others. Not to mention, it's extremely efficient. So we could hone our golf swing, for instance, by practicing for many, many years. And through trial and error, we would become better. But another way of going about it is to have someone teach us to have a pro help us. And similarly, you could, if you wanted to know about various aspects of the world and all the different cultures, you could travel around, well, not now, but uh, you could, in theory, see all those parts of the world firsthand, but it's much more efficient to have a teacher relay that information. So the point I wanna make is we do all of this social learning, and that's the, the main way that children learn is through learning from other people. But people make mistakes, so it's important to be selective social learners. People are fallible, they can convey misinformation out of ignorance or even sometimes out of deception. People regularly provide information even when they're uncertain. We differ in levels of knowledge, so some people are more knowledgeable than others about uh, certain topics, they have different areas of expertise. Some people know a lot about math or biology, other people know a lot about history or art. And people offer opinions, not just facts. And so for those reasons, it's very, very important that children be selective. There's this a uh, common misconception that children are passive sponges and they're just absorbing any and all information that they're exposed to. And while they are learning incredibly rapidly, they're not doing so passively. They're very active in, and selective in who they prefer to learn from and what information they prefer to learn. So for example, uh, I guess I should say, so then the question is how do children decide who is the most knowledgeable source, who is the best, most credible person to learn from. Fortunately, there's a lot of cues that children can use to decide who's likely to be the most knowledgeable source. So uh, from previous work, we know that children as young as three pay attention to who explicitly claims to be knowledgeable. So if somebody says, oh, I know that's a blicket, versus someone says, mm, maybe that's a blicket, then they're more likely to learn from the person who explicitly claims to be knowledgeable. They also tend to prefer to learn from adults over children, or at least, or even older children over younger children. So they, they've made this uh, link between older people knowing more than younger people. But I will say it's topic dependent, so it's not all the time. If it's about Dora the Explorer or different kinds of dinosaurs, a particularly popular children's toy, they actually learn better from their peers. They seem to know that they're the experts on that subject matter. 
but in, on average, they tend to learn more from older children and adults in comparison to younger children. And they even keep track of who has the best track record of accuracy. So if somebody has a history of repeatedly making mistakes such as mislabeling objects over and over again, and someone else has a history of being accurate at labeling objects, then they prefer to learn from the person with the better track record. They seem to be monitoring who's got the um, history of being the most accurate. And then in some work that I'll briefly mention now, they also pay attention to who other people are attending to, who appears more confident, but they also eventually uh, around age five start to pay attention to who is overconfident, who's offering information uh, that's inaccurate and doing so with confidence. So I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. In terms of people others attend to, we did these studies in my lab with three and four year olds and we had two models. This is Micah and this is Jasmine. And then we had three bystanders and the bystanders give all of their attention to one particular model, Micah in this case, we counterbalance which one serves as the, as the person that's gonna receive all the attention. So there's two models, three bystanders, and then the bystanders uh, leave and they see Micah and Jasmine interacting with novel objects, so things that these children have never seen before. And there's always uh, a choice that the model has to make. So the bystanders are gone and each model makes a choice. So she's uh, choosing to use the green blocks. And when Jasmine comes along to play with this, she uses the, the green ovals. And then Jasmine uses this uh, uh, lever to make this object work and Micah uses the other level lever. And then we give these to the child and we see which ones, uh, what they imitate, who they imitate rather. So the child is given a choice. And what we find is that children tend to learn from Micah, whoever uh, was in the position of having all of the attention from other people. This is a little bit like something we call social referencing. So when people are uncertain about um, a novel situation, they will tend to look to other people. What do you think? Um, right, we, we reference other people all the time and children seem to have picked up on this and they're looking to see who's getting the most attention, who, who are other people looking at as, as a cue to, well, they those people think this person's in the know that person's probably the person I should learn from. So it's quite striking how um, even something like other people's attention can guide their learning choices. I also said that they pay attention to who appears more confident. So I'll show you one example of that. Again, we showed uh, young children. This is two to four year olds. Uh, two models, this is Jane and this is Courtney. And one of the models is going to be confident in her actions and the other is going to be more hesitant. And this is all demonstrated through nonverbal cues. So facial expression and body language such as shoulder shrugging. Uh, so they get a series of objects that they can interact with. For example, this uh, there's two tools, a yellow tool and a white tool that could be used to pick up the egg and put it in the container. And Jane will confidently pick up the yellow one and Courtney will hesitantly pick up the uh, white one. And then we give these to the child to see who they imitate. I can show you a video of what that looks like for one trial. And these videos don't have sound, it was all nonverbal. So the children are just using facial expressions and body language to pick up on confidence or hesitancy. This is Courtney and she's looking like she's never seen this object before. <laughs> looking a little puzzled. I'm gonna make a choice between these two tools. And then they see the other and we counterbalance which order across children who goes first and who plays the confident model. And so now Jane sees the same object, same two tools, but she looks like she knows what she's doing. She grabs the other tool and 
interacts with the object. Then we give these to the child and we say, can you show me what to do with this? And we record what they do. And what we find is that overall, children tend to prefer the more confident model. So they imitated the confident model's actions across all of these different, uh, I think there were six trials. They imitated the confident model about 64% of the time, whereas only 36% of the time they imitated the hesitant model's actions. And this is children as young as two years of age. They were imitating the more confident person. As well, in some follow-up research by a former uh, graduate student of mine, they showed that even children as young as 24 months, but not by 18 months, did they pay attention to nonverbal cues uh, of confidence when learning. And then lastly, I said I would show you um, that they also, over the pre preschool period, become um, more sophisticated in their understanding of confidence. So initially they start out paying attention to whoever is the most confident, but between age four and five, we see this shift where they actually become wary of people that are confident if they've been confident when making a bunch of mistakes. So for instance, in this study, again, we had two models, one hesitant model who's accurate, and the other model who's overconfident repeatedly. And the repeatedly is important. I'm not suggesting that just being overconfident once or twice would uh, affect the child. But if this, in this case, we showed the models being repeatedly overconfident. So we presented um, images of animals and things that the child at four and five years of age was familiar with, so in this case, a whale. And our overconfident model, she says, oh, I know, whales live in the ground. Whereas our other model, she's more hesitant. She says, hmm, I guess whales live in the water. So even though she's hesitant, she's actually the more accurate person. And we did this over a series of trials where they keep seeing this model repeatedly being confident, but giving false or inaccurate information. And then they get a choice to learn about the name of this fish and other novel objects from either model. So our overconfident model says it's a paddlefish and our hesitant but accurate model says it's a lantern fish. And we asked the child whether they thought it was a paddlefish or a lantern fish. What we found, as I mentioned, is that five-year-olds but not four-year-olds avoided learning from this overconfident model. So even though they would typically prefer a confident model over a hesitant model, these data suggest that they've paid attention not just to the confidence in the person's voice, but whether that confidence was matched their accuracy. And so if they were repeatedly making mistakes, and doing so with great confidence, they became overly wary of that person. So to conclude then, um, young children are very savvy selective learners. They're not just paying attention, they're not just passively absorbing information. They're actually making pretty savvy and sophisticated judgments about who's the best source of information to learn from. And that's very important since I said the vast majority of the knowledge that we possess as adults is information we've acquired from other people. So it's important that they're being uh, savvy and selective. And fortunately, there are many different cues that young children can use to infer who's most knowledgeable. I've just mentioned a few, such as paying attention to someone's track record or how confident they are or whether their confidence matches their accuracy. But there's a whole host of cues. Vo vocal cues, for instance, is something I'm looking at now in my research. Vocal cues seem to be um, a later skill to pick up on vocal cues to confidence and hesitancy seems to be a later developing skill. I briefly will mention um, just a, uh, I focused a lot on the skills that young children have and how sophisticated they are at um, figuring out who's the more credible source. But I also want to mention a limitation that both children and adults have in perspective taking. 
And that's something called the curse of knowledge bias. In short, it's a bias to think that other people will know what you know, or it's a, it's a tendency to think that uh, other people will know information that you have. So it's um, the technical definition is it's a tendency to be biased by one's own knowledge when reasoning about a more naive perspective. There's a lot of uh, ways you can look at this. We used uh, trivia questions a lot. So for instance, um, and this is true for adults as well, if I ask you where this is, uh, this is the Trevi Fountain. And if I were to ask you uh, how many people do you think know how many adults your age know where the Trevi Fountain is located? If you know where it's located, you overestimate the likelihood that other people will know that. But if you don't know where it's located, you're actually much more accurate at gauging what other people know. So it's not that you are egocentric and think if I don't know it, no one will know it. And if I know it, people will know it. It's actually this one directional where we get biased by the information that we have. And there's work in education, for instance, um, teachers who are more knowledgeable about a particular subject are actually less accurate in predicting how a novice will perform on a task. And this is probably something that you've seen uh, in experienced yourself because we all suffer uh, from this bias to some degree. Um, I think I will jump ahead and well, I can maybe mention one more study with four to seven year olds where we've shown this bias in young children. Uh, so for, for instance, we would say, how many children will know which kind of bird is the smartest? And we have one group where we don't tell them the answer to the question and another group where we tell them a crow is the smartest bird. And then we have both groups guess how many other children will know that. Uh, to test this, we actually have them use this little, um, we demonstrate how to use this chart where we say, if no one knows it, you'd click here. A couple is here, some is here. If a lot of children know it, you'd point here. And if a whole lot of children know it, you'd point here. And we demonstrate this with easy questions and hard questions and make sure they understand how to use this. And then we teach them a bunch of facts. And again, what we find is if they are taught the answer, even if they just learned it a moment ago, they think that other people will know that as well. Fortunately, this is a bias that declines with age. Um, as I mentioned, it's been demonstrated in a variety of settings. So business settings, medical decision-making, legal and political settings, education, and it even occurs across cultures. So uh, some of the work we did recently was with Turkana children in Kenya, and we found even those children are uh, cursed by their knowledge. Though it is environmentally malleable, we found the boys were showing this to a greater extent than the girls. And we think this has to do with the fact that the boys are spending more time, more isolated. They are uh, out in the fields and the pastures herding animals, and that's a very solitary day-to-day uh, -day, uh, job, whereas the girls are spending much more time interacting with other children. So I said I wanted to wrap up by uh, talking about whether we can improve perspective taking. And the answer is yes, we can improve our own perspective taking and we can improve our children's perspective taking. The key is through practice and discussion. So there's quite a lot of work on the various ways that we can foster perspective taking in children. One uh, example is through role taking or imaginative play. So children tend, especially young children, they tend to love to take on different roles and pretend to be teachers or doctors or superheroes or have tea. And those are really great ways to uh, foster perspective taking. It's sort of literally putting themselves, well, not literally, <laughs> metaphorically putting themselves in someone else's shoes. So it is a, a form of perspective taking. 
And as kids get older, there's evidence that acting in plays, not even like formal acting lessons, but just participating in uh, you know, school plays or community plays or any kind of role taking behavior is really helpful. As well, there's a lot of evidence showing that uh, parents and uh, other people's use of mental state talk in the home. Mental state talk is exactly what it sounds. It's just talking about mental states. So using words like want and think and know, um, think, talking about emotions and dreaming and pretending Using that language regularly around the child is a, a wonderful way for them to pick up on what those words means and how these invisible, intangible mental states work. We can't see mental states, we can't touch them. And so a lot of the learning that children do about mental states is through um, some amount of explicit teaching and people um, discussing mental states and elaborating on those mental states. As an example, there's work that shows that parents that use um, pretty much any opportunity to just ask their child about mental states. So asking, you know, if there's been a transgression and someone harmed them or they harmed someone else, just asking, how would you feel if that had happened to you? Or what do you think that person was thinking when they stole your crayons, for instance? Uh, so yeah, what do you think he was thinking? How would you feel? Uh, what do you think was going through their mind? Why do you think they were feeling that way? All of those kinds of elaborations can be super helpful. And uh, finally, through books, um, I saw a really interesting talk the other day. We know that preschoolers actually prefer books that discuss mental state content over um, books that just talk about physical activities. They seem to really engage with thinking about what other people are thinking and feeling. Uh, but sometimes just reading the book isn't enough, especially with young children. And just to give you one example, this is from a book called The Black Rabbit. And um, it says, but something was wrong. He was not alone. And they're saying in the book that the white rabbit is not alone. Rabbit was scared. He says, go away, black rabbit. But the black rabbit didn't move. And I think young children seeing this might not really be able to grasp what is happening. They're going to need a parent to say things like, what is the rabbit? What is the white rabbit thinking? Why is the rabbit scared? Um, why is the black rabbit not listening to, and to the white rabbit when he says, go away? I think um, they need a, a parent maybe to say, look, it's actually his shadow. He thinks it's another rabbit, but it's really just his shadow. Um, he, was, he was wrong, he was mistaken. And I think that kind of elaboration and discussion uh, is really, really helpful for young children. So the take home messages then um, are that social perspective taking promotes healthy development in a variety of ways. It fosters learning and development. It impacts pro-social behavior, academic achievement, relationship quality. And fortunately, there are many ways to promote social perspective taking. The biggest one being just practice and discussion. The more they hear about mental states, the more they'll learn about how they work. Thank you. And thanks from all of us at the Early Development Research Group. And as Sav said, uh, if you have an interest in participating, if you have a young child, you can sign up for our EDRG. You can scan this or go to the edrg.psych.ubc website. Um, you can sign up for any uh, of a variety of studies across the seven different labs. Currently, I'm conducting one over Zoom with children six to eight year olds. And this is looking at those uh, vocal cues that I mentioned and how they use vocal cues to a person's hesitancy or confidence. And if you're interested, we have the online study for parents. Uh, actually, it's open to any adult, but we're also asking if, if parents are filling it out to complete the survey on behalf of uh, their child as well. And you can participate to win a gift card. So you can uh, sign up here or reach out to us through our website. 
We also want to let you know about our next speaker uh, that's part of this Wonder Kids series of talks, and that's Dr. Darko Odick, who will be talking about what do babies know about numbers. So thank you. It's time for our Q&A. Thank you, Sue. Um, I just wanted to note as well, uh, this talk will be posted. So if you didn't catch those links, it's going to be up Monday. Um, and we'll also um, put the link separately on the web page as well. Um, and if you do sign up for the EDRG database, how that works is that um, you give us your contact information and some information about your child or children, and we will match you to studies and then invite you each and every time there is a study that you are eligible for. Um, awesome, there have been some great questions that have come in already, but uh, if you'd like to submit more or you can vote um, for the questions that have already been submitted that you would like answered, uh, that would be great. And so you just click the Q and A button that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, so to start, Sue, so we have a question about counterbalancing. If you don't mind describing a little bit what that is and, and how you counterbalance in some of those studies that you uh, were talking about. Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So anytime we are doing these studies, we want to make sure that the one factor that we're manipulating is what's contributing to the change in the child's behavior. So for example, with the confidence one where we have one confident model and one hesitant model, when I say we counterbalance, what I mean is um, whoever serves as the confident model will do that for half of the children and that person will be the hesitant model for the other half of the children. In that way, it's not anything about what she looks like or what she's wearing or her hair color or her ethnicity um, because she will play, each model plays the confident person half of the time. And similarly, the order could matter, right? Maybe you, maybe a child will learn from whoever speaks last. Um, regardless of confidence and hesitancy. So we always balance the order such that half of the time the confident person goes first and half of the time the confident person goes last. That's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, is the social learning theory, uh, like the Bobo doll experiment, for example, linked to the social perspective taking? Uh, it's there's a connection for sure. So the Bobo doll experiment is, uh, is another example of how we learn a lot from other people. They were focused, uh, Bandura, who did the Bobo doll experiment, focused a lot more on um, learning a broader set of behaviors and imitating other people. Whereas in my work, I'm focusing more not just on uh, the actions of other people, but how they make inferences about these unobservable mental states. So in that sense, it goes a, a, maybe a step further and we're not just seeing if they'll imitate other people, but we're seeing, can they make inferences about other people's mental states and do those inferences drive their imitation choices? So yeah, they're definitely linked. Um, ours is more about the mental state understanding. Is a child's tendency to imitate a hesitant versus confident model at all influenced by their personality? So when we saw that 64% of kids would um, tend to use the strategy by the confident model, what's going on with those other 36%? That's a really great question. I wish I had a better answer for you because it's a question I'd like to know the answer for myself. There's some people, some researchers that have started looking at individual differences and how that might contribute. I think you're, I think you're onto something in that I share the intuition that there's probably individual differences. So for instance, if uh, the child felt pretty confident that they could figure it out on their own, then maybe they wouldn't be so reliant on someone else. Um, I think it's also going to depend on how uh, convinced the child was by the other person's confidence. And then of course there's gonna be variability in terms of whether any given child wants to explore it on their own. So they might be thinking, so those 36%, they may have even recognized that one person was more confident but now they have an opportunity to, to interact with it in a, on their own. And they might actually be thinking, oh, well, let me try what the other person did. Why, why does this also work? So there's definitely, I think, a lot going on. Um, but it's also possible that there's variability in, in who's swayed by confidence. So 
Um, I'm sure you can all think of people that are overly confident and get swayed by confidence. Um, political figures come to mind. And so what, what a study that I'm thinking of actually shows that um, even adults, when they're under cognitive load, when they're tired, when they're distracted, they will actually defer and pay attention to somebody who's confident, even if they have a history of being overconfident or if they have reason to, um, to ignore them. So sometimes our actions are really driven not by what we can do, but just we're not totally focused in that moment. So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think there's a lot that could be going on there. Related question, um, is social perspective taking perhaps related to one's emotional intelligence? Absolutely. So yes, uh, when we talk about emotional intelligence, there's again, uh, it's a, a multifaceted concept. Some people, again, there's a lot of disagreement on what counts as emotional intelligence, but social perspective taking is almost always considered one aspect of emotional intelligence. Yeah. How were the inferences generalized to a larger population? Were the samples chosen keeping in mind common characteristics and or differences? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will be honest that uh, our samples are usually convenience samples. By that, I mean they're the children that we can access, um, parents that are willing and able to bring their child into our lab. Uh, so they tend to be parents that are higher, uh, from families that are higher SES, higher education, higher uh, household income. They are fairly representative of the ethnic diversity within Vancouver. But whether they're representative of, you know, all children or all North American children, I suspect if anything, we're probably overestimating. I think our children tend to be, like I said, higher SES, probably really good um, home environments. And um, if anything, they might be a little bit more sophisticated than if we were to test these on really broad samples. But on the whole, I think they're, they're fairly representative because we're looking mostly at skills that we think would come with typical development. We don't expect to see a ton of variability based on char uh, sample characteristics. And last question for now anyway, I love this question. Um, can undergraduate students get involved uh, to participate or help conduct or analyze the studies at UBC? Absolutely. We would not be able to do this research without really fantastic undergraduates. Um, so I have a, a team of undergraduates, a uh, combination of uh, students that are doing um, course credit uh, so they can participate in our research uh, environment for course credit and they do projects. Uh, we also have volunteer research assistants, students doing honors, um, a variety of uh, different opportunities for undergrads and they do anything and everything from recruiting you have probably as parents gotten calls from some of our undergraduates uh, sometimes they even do some of the testing and data collection and analysis as well so we right now are six centers about to be seven and we typically have between 75 and 100 undergraduate students helping with our research every term so um, lots and lots and lots of opportunities to get involved so whoever's asking that question, if you'd like to get involved, we would just love that. And you can find out more on our website. So those are all the questions um, that have come in so far, but we can definitely hang out for a few minutes if any more come to mind. Um, what I might do is I wanna make sure, um, I just wanna say like if parents are looking at our research and they're thinking to themselves, oh, you know, I, I worry that I've been, you know, making false claims. Sometimes I realize I've made mistakes. I, I wanna say that our, our experiments are sort of very simple, right? We are setting this up in a, you know, where one variable is being manipulated and it doesn't really reflect, reflect real life. In real life, uh, children have a variety of different cues that they use. 
Um, so they prefer to learn from people who they're familiar with, people that they have good relationships with. And so it doesn't just boil down to the few cues that I talked about today. I certainly don't think parents could make any mistakes that their child isn't resilient to. Um, that's the really nice thing is that children are super, super resilient. So if you've been overconfident in the past, you don't need to worry. <laughs> Your child is <laughs> very forgiving. While we wait, I'll throw up the uh, sign up for next for our Perfect. next. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, Darko's work is very cool as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. You don't think of babies as knowing about number. Oh, I see something's coming here. Uh, another question, Sue, what are some possible implications of these inferences if the study lacks in ecological validity? Um, or slightly artificial in nature? Yeah, another great question. Um, so as I mentioned, ours are somewhat artificial in nature, right? Because it's in a laboratory setting and we're just manipulating one thing. The reason we do it that way, uh, it, the reason we make them um, artificial in that sense is so that we can isolate whether children can attend to these cues. And it doesn't, what it doesn't tell us then is whether they do in a real world setting or how often they do in a real world setting. The main reason uh, that we're doing the research this way and where we're conducting an experiment and we just manipulate one factor is so that we can sort of map on when a child can understand these different milestones um, the, and which skills could potentially influence a child. And then I think it's uh, up to future research endeavors to then move into a more naturalistic environment and see now when all of these factors come together Together, right? Because somebody could have a history of being accurate but not be confident. They could be using um, good vocal cues, but their emotional uh, expression might signal that they're less confident. So how children flexibly use those cues is going to be really important work going forward. Wonderful. All right, well, let's leave it at that. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sue, for coming today and for speaking to us. And um, we hope that um, we will see many of you again at some of these future talks that are coming. And as I said, we will make sure we get the links up online as well in case you would like to either sign up for our database or participate in particular in that really cool um, COVID uh, study that Sue is running right now. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.